Hey there, everybody. Mr. Mark with you. Today we're going to work on our physics problem solving skills just a little bit, specifically on this skill that we're going to refer to as derive an equation. And so the first thing I have on here for you is an example from an actual AP Physics 1 exam where the question was derive an equation for the velocity of a spacecraft. Actually, it was the orbital period, but we're not yet at a point where we really know what that means. <clears throat> of the spacecraft in terms of little m, big M, subscript ER, and physical constants, such as G, for example, um, as appropriate. And so this, this is a skill that you are going to be tested on, and it's it's really important skill for a couple of different reasons. So from the AP Physics 1 um, exam and course description guide, derive is defined as perform a series of mathematical steps using equations or laws to arrive at a final answer. Usually what that answer looks like is an equation or an expression. So instead of a something like velocity equals... 10 meters per second, it might look something more like acceleration equals T1 minus M1G over M2. That would be like what the final answer would look like when you're asked to derive an equation. So why is this answer on the right better than the answer on the left? There's a couple of different reasons. Number one, a specific numerical answer isn't as useful as a general relationship between variables. And we can use that general relationship to answer many questions and make many predictions about many possible situations. For instance, this will tell me when the acceleration is positive versus negative when I start messing around with M1 and T1. This doesn't really give me that same information. This is something I can graph, and I can see if there's asymptotes or limits to it, um, and I can get a broader understanding about what's happening around these variables. Um, kind of in that same vein, a general relationship unveils the functional dependence of one variable on another. So if I increase this mass, how does that change the acceleration of this thing? Um, you get a better answer usually when you do this. You don't have to worry about calculating things. You don't have to worry about rounding in between. And so this is actually an easier answer to understand and to agree on than something like V equals 10 meters per second. Because maybe some other student says, well, V equals 9.9 .9 meters per second. Maybe somebody else says it's 10.2 meters per second. And that's like, are these really the same? And so that is, those are all the reasons why we want to kind of be able to do something like this, where we get an answer without using numbers that we can then kind of get more general ideas about what's happening from that answer. So in this handout, I've got a bunch of examples. I'm going to do three of them with you, and then I'm going to leave you to do the remaining six on your own. And I've broken these up into three parts. The first three are kind of simple. The second three require you to be able to eliminate a variable, like cancel something out. And then the third part requires you to be able to substitute one expression in for another. So let's start with the first one. In this example, we've got an object of mass m moving to the right, subjected to two forces which act in different directions, f1 to the right and f2 to the left. So real simple free body diagram, here's my object. Here is f1, and then here is f2. Now, I don't know anything about how big these are. I don't have any numbers. That's kind of what we want to do is go, all right, what situation will this be bigger than this, and what does that do? In situations where this is bigger than this, what does that mean? So derive an equation for the acceleration of the object in terms of the given quantities and physical constants as appropriate. And on the AP exam, that's kind of always how they word that. Um, given quantities like F one, F2, and M, and then fundamental constants would include numbers like little g, and then later on we're going to learn about big G, the universal gravitation constant. So to find the acceleration of something, I might start off with Newton's second law, like acceleration equals the sum of the forces over the mass. On the AP exam, when you derive an equation, the bar for your work is very, very high. Like you need to show clearly that you're starting with Newton's second law to find the acceleration on something. 
then you might show your substitution. Okay, so the mass M is just M. And then our net forces, if I assume right to be my positive direction, might look like F1 and then minus F2. And for this real simple example, that's, that's it. I've got an acceleration, that's what I'm looking for. And then my expression, F1 minus F2 over M, that's in terms of all the things that I know. And so I know F1, that's a given. I know F2, that's a given. And I know M, that is a given as well. So this is my answer to this question. There's my expression for the acceleration of the object under these conditions. If I knew the numbers, I went with F1 and F2, like 12 newtons and 44 newtons, I could then substitute those in here and figure out a numeric value for the acceleration under those specific values, but this gives me a general picture. So the follow-up question to this, under what conditions will the object move to the right and slow down? So if it's moving to the right, which is positive and slowing down, that means we're looking for, basically, when is the acceleration negative? And so I can look at this and go, okay, A is going to be negative if mass is negative. Well, it's not possible to have mass negative. Let's throw that out. If the top is negative, then that would also make the acceleration negative. And so for the top numerator of my equation to be negative, that's just going to come from F2 being larger than F1. So if F2 is greater than F1, then F1 minus F2 is negative. Kind of expanding on our, our answer there. And therefore, that's a big word acceleration is negative. So that's a real simple example and most of us could probably look at the free body diagram we'll go with the red arrow is bigger then it's going to move to the right and slow down. If this arrow is bigger it's going to move to the right and speed up. This gives us a mathematical leg to stand on and most of the situations we're going to deal with are not as simple as just look at it and decide between two forces. Maybe there's three forces. Um, maybe there is some additional terms in the denominator. So that's a simple example, but it illustrates how we might use a derived equation to then make a prediction about what's going to happen. Okay, so let's skip forward to the third question, actually the fourth question, under part two here, where it says part two, part two elimination. So elimination is kind of sort of a fancy way, mathematically correct way of saying cancel. So you're going to find a lot of situations where a physical quantity doesn't really affect the expression that we're looking for. And so all of these, that's going to be the case. So in question four, we've got a baseball player who is moving at constant velo initial velocity, rather, v naught, who slides to a stop on the baseball field. Coefficient of kinetic friction and static friction are mu k and mu s. Derive an expression for the acceleration of the player while he slides in terms of the given quantities and fundamental constants as appropriate. So here is my baseball player. And so if he's sliding, you know, maybe there's fg and fn. And then if he's, I'm just going to say he's moving to the right. So there's is initial velocity. So if he's moving to the right and sliding to the, to a stop, that would be because friction is going to the left. And since he's moving, that would be kinetic friction. And there's our free body diagram. And so the question asks us for an acceleration. So just like the previous example, you might start off by using Newton's second law. So acceleration is net force divided by the mass. You might go, well, in this case, I don't know what the mass of the baseball player is. And so we're going to have to either A, figure that mass out some sort of way, or B, find a way to eliminate it from our equation. So usually the answer is going to be B. Let's figure out how we can eliminate that mass. So my net force equation 
net force in the x direction would just be equal to that frictional force. And since I'm just looking for an acceleration here, I'm gonna go ahead and make left my positive direction. So I can leave those two terms positive. And so I can find a frictional force by doing mu times the normal force. Since it's kinetic friction, I'm gonna do mu k. And then since the normal force is balancing the force of gravity, assuming the baseball field is level, which I'm sure we spent good money in leveling the baseball field, I can replace that with Fg. And then since Fg is equal to Mg, I can say that the force of kinetic friction is equal to mu k times Mg. So if I substitute that, into my expression of Newton's second law. And again, the, the bar for our work when it, it says derive an equation, speaking about AP exam questions, is very high. So I need to be explicit about showing that substitution. Then I can look at that and go, well, m divided by m is one. We would say a lot of times they cancel. And so I get something that looks like A equals mu K times G. And that's my answer. And so the, the rougher the field is relative to the baseball player, the bigger his acceleration is, the quicker he's going to slow down. And it also depends on the planet that we're on. So if we were playing baseball on the surface of Jupiter, we would slow down to a stop much, much quicker than we would when we're playing baseball on Earth. So the follow-up to this, 4b, how would the results differ if the baseball player had a greater mass? Well, if we look at our final expression, there is no mass in that final expression. So we could say that they won't differ. And that's as simple as saying the mass does not appear in the acceleration expression, or we can say the acceleration does not depend on the mass. And that's going to happen actually quite a bit in physics this year. Because the mass does two jobs, it resists acceleration and it sometimes causes or affects a lot of these forces, we're going to see a lot of situations where we have force over mass. The force is dependent somewhat on the mass and so those m's are going to eliminate or cancel out. So those next two questions, you should be looking for things to be eliminated or canceled. Let's look at the third section real quick. I entitled this section Substitution because what we're going to have to do for some of these questions is substitute one expression into another. And we kind of sort of did a simple example of that right here um, where I said, okay, the net force is equal to frictional force. And so instead of net force, I substituted in friction equals mu times the normal force. And instead of normal force, I substituted in Fg. And instead of Fg, I substituted in Mg. And then I substituted that in over here. So substitution of one expression or equation into another is going to appear a lot as well. So that's what these questions are designed to help illustrate. So in question number seven, I've got a box of mass M pulled to the right by a spring of spring constant K. So there's a box. Here is a spring, so we'll label that FS, and so K goes along with the spring. The box moves at constant velocity V due to friction. So let's go ahead and draw friction going left. Since it's moving, I'm guessing that's kinetic friction. And since it moves at a constant velocity, that tells me that the forces are balanced. So that those two forces, if those are the only two horizontal forces, would be um, balancing each other. We know the coefficient of kinetic and static friction is mu k and mu s. Derive an expression for the stretch of the spring, x, in terms of the given quantities and fundamental constants as appropriate. So just to finish off my free body diagram here. Dramatic pause. Okay, so my free body diagram might look something like that. 
So we're looking for the stretch of the spring and that's X. So X is equal to my question mark here. So just like most situations, we might start off by first writing a net force equation. So net force in the X direction is equal to, I'm gonna go ahead and make right the positive direction since I really don't have any reason not to. So that would be the force exerted by the spring and then minus the force of kinetic friction. And then again, because those forces are balanced, I can say that those have to add up to zero. So if I wanted to, I could right away go ahead and say that the force exerted by the spring is equal to the force of kinetic friction. If this were an AP exam question and you went, oh, those are equal to each other, I'm just going to start right there, that may not be good enough. You may really need to explicitly show this first, even though it's a relatively simple net force equation. Again, if we're talking about AP exam questions, the clarity of your work and the amount of work you need to show and where you need to start are very, very high. Start from a basic principle, net force equation, and Newton's first law, the forces are balanced. Okay, so I can go back into my Wayback Machine and I can remember that the force exerted by a spring is equal to K times X, where K is a spring constant and X is the stretch. And I can also do what we just did and go, all right, the force of friction is equal to mu K times the normal force. And then just like we did a few minutes ago, since the normal force equals the weight and the weight is M times G, I can do this and say mu K times MG. So I have these two equations that I can now substitute for these two quantities into this equation right here. So instead of FS, I can put K times X. Instead of the force of kinetic friction, I can put mu k times mg. Now, do be kind of careful right there, and don't be in a hurry to think that the m is going to cancel out, just like it did a second ago, because there's no m on the left side. So this one, the answer is going to depend on the mass. So now I just got to solve that for k. So divide both sides by k and then just copy the mu k mg. A lot of algebra, y'all, is just careful copying. So copy carefully. Okay, so x is what I'm looking for. x is isolated. Let's do a quick check and make sure that all these things are things I'm given. Mu k, uh, I'm given that. Mass, I have the mass of this box. I have k, the spring constant, and g would qualify as a fundamental or physical constant. So everything that's in my expression right now are things that I know in the problem, and so I can do that. That's my answer. And the follow-up to this one is, how would increasing the mass of the box change the stretch of the spring? So here, it's just a matter of going, okay, well, is M in the equation? Yeah, the, the mass is in the equation. Um, is it in the numerator or the denominator? So since it's in the numerator, making M bigger would make X bigger. So increasing the mass would increase x, the stretch in the spring. And the answer would just be directly from that equation. It shows up in the numerator. If you said on top, that would probably be okay, but don't let your algebra teacher hear you do that. So since M is in the numerator, increasing M would decrease X. And so we can just rely on the functional dependence, to use a really fancy word, between M and X in this equation to answer this question about what physically changing the mass of the box does to the stretch of the spring. And again, you could probably go, well, if I've got more mass, that means I'll have more friction since the box will be pushed into the ground with more force, which means I have to pull it with the spring harder and pulling it harder with the spring means it has to stretch more. Um, but this gives us kind of a way to do that without having to necessarily connect all those physical dots. 
in a lot of AP exam questions, they actually ask you to answer these kind of questions using both the relationship or the equation that you derive as well as physical re reasoning, kind of like, okay, well, what happens to this force and how does that affect this force and connect the dots physically. Um, in AP physics world, those are often referred to as quantitative qualitative translation equations, connecting the mathematics to physical reality. Um, and that's a skill we're gonna kind of work on as we go throughout the next few weeks is connecting what we get from this expression to what we can predict by looking at the physical situation and using what we know about physics. So those are three examples done with me. The rest of these examples, and I certainly recommend you start with number two, they're designed to go from easy to more difficult as you go through this. Um, but the rest of those examples are up for you to do. I'm gonna provide you with the answers. Um, I'm not gonna provide you with the solutions because if your answer doesn't match mine, the first question I wanna ask yourself is, is it an equivalent expression? Like, is it still correct? For instance, in this first question that we did, it would be equally okay to say that A is equal to F1 over M minus F2 over M. Like you could break that up into two separate fractions like that. That would be a correct answer as well. So just because your answer doesn't exactly match my answer doesn't mean that it's not the same thing. So that's one reason why I'm not providing the solutions is because I want you to do that thinking on your own. And then number two, if you did make a mistake, I want you to go back and have to find your mistake yourself today. That doesn't mean you don't have support. Your classmates are with you and I'm with you. And so if you're stuck on where your mistake was, by all means, please let somebody know and please get clarity. But I'm not gonna provide solutions for you today. I'm gonna make you do a little bit more thinking today. That's why you only have six of these to do on your own today. So jump in, start with number two, jump into those and let me know where you need help and clarification. Till then, ta-ta.